This is the chilling story of Sebastian Gronewald, a man who lived two very different lives. By day, the 45-year-old was a constable in the Ikurhulini Metro Police Department, one of the highly trained members of the elite Special Weapons and Tactics Unit in Germ Istan, South Africa. But off-duty, Gronewald had a much darker identity. As a ruthless gang leader and professional hitman, deeply entangled in the criminal underworld. His shocking double life only came fully to light in April 2020, when Gronewald's bullet-riddled body was discovered dumped in a field on the outskirts of Riger Park. But this was no random killing. It was the culmination of a shadowy saga involving family ties, gang rivalries, deadly revenge, assassinations in the cigarette trade, and corruption that went to the heart of law enforcement. This is the tangled web of Sebastian Gronewald, the cop who became a killer for hire, to understand Sebastian Gronewald's path, you have to start with his family background. He grew up in Riger Park, a community east of Johannesburg that has long been plagued by gang activity and violence. Sebastian was one of three brothers, and the other two, Mark and Sean Gronewald, were both deeply involved in the criminal underworld. The brothers were prominent members of a feared local gang called the Docks, named after a favored car model they liked to steal. With Mark and Sean as leaders, the docks were involved in all manner of illegal activities, car theft, drug dealing, cigarette truck heists. But Sebastian didn't join them in the gang. Instead, he chose a very different path by becoming a police officer. On the surface, Sebastian seemed to be an exemplary cop. He had served in the Ekerhuleni Metro Police Department for over a decade without any official blemishes on his record. As a member of the EMPD's Special Weapons and Tactics team, he was entrusted with advanced firearms training and sensitive operations. But beneath that veneer of respectability, Sebastian was living a dangerous double life. According to investigators and underworld sources, he was the Docs Gang's secret weapon. He acted as their insurance policy, a man on the inside who could help plan robberies and then respond first to the crime scenes to cover their tracks. Protected by their police officer brother, Mark and Sean were able to tighten their grip on the Ryder Park underworld. But in December 2017, this precarious family dynamic was shattered when Sebastian's brother Mark was gunned down outside a shopping center. Mark was known as the Bin Laden of Ryder Park for his ruthless control over the area's criminal underworld. He had just been released from prison in December 2017 after serving a lengthy sentence for murder and other gang-related crimes. His reputation for brutality and his position as the leader of the Docks Gang had made him a feared figure in the community. But Mark's return to the streets was short-lived. Just days after his release, as he was leaving a local shopping center, a group of rival gangsters ambushed him in a hail of bullets. The brazen daylight attack left Mark dead on the scene and sent shockwaves through Riger Park's criminal circles. For Sebastian, the loss of his brother was a devastating blow, both personally and professionally. Mark had been more than just a sibling. He had been Sebastian's partner in crime and the mastermind behind the doc's illegal activities that Sebastian helped facilitate through his position in the police. With Mark gone, Sebastian not only lost a brother but also his main connection to the criminal world he had been straddling for so long. Devastated and enraged by Mark's assassination, Sebastian began plotting his revenge against those he believed were responsible. And as a police officer, he had access to an extremely dangerous weapon to carry out his vengeance, an R5 assault rifle stolen from the police armory. Over the next several months, Sebastian, accompanied by his friend and alleged accomplice Jonathan Showman, carried out a series of chilling drive-by shootings across Riger Park. Their targets were all people Sebastian suspected of being involved in his brother's murder. In September 2019, a man named Shiraz Obere was gunned down on Erica Street in a hail of bullets. In December, known gangster Antonio Pleitges was shot 23 times near his home. Tragically, his girlfriend Antoinette de Jager was also hit in the fusillade, later dying of her injuries. The killings continued into 2020. On New Year's Day, Michael McKenzie was slain in a drive-by shooting, losing control of his car as he tried to escape the onslaught of gunfire. Just 10 days later, Mackenzie's friend, Gordon Peterson, met an equally brutal end, his car riddled with bullets after leaving a ceremony to unveil Mackenzie's tombstone. In each case, the modus operandi was the same, a barrage of shots fired from an automatic rifle, with Sebastian allegedly pulling the trigger 
and his accomplice showman serving as the getaway driver. On the surface, it appeared that Sebastian's initial foray into the world of murder was driven by a desire to avenge his brother's death. The truth of the matter was that his actions were not solely limited to this personal vendetta. Even as he stalked the streets of Riger Park, unleashing a reign of terror against those he believed responsible for Mark's murder, Sebastian was also leading a parallel life as a hitman for various underworld figures, his deadly skills available to the highest bidder. Their main targets were two prominent figures in the cigarette business, Simon Rudland, co-owner of Goldleaf Tobacco, and Mohammed Syed, director of Carnalink's Tobacco. In August 2019, Rudlin narrowly survived an attempt on his life in the upscale Johannesburg suburb of Norwood. On that fateful day, Rudlin was arriving for a meeting at the offices of the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association, an industry body representing the interests of smaller cigarette manufacturers. As he pulled into the parking lot in his sleek, high-performance Porsche, he had no idea that he was being stalked by a team of hitmen. Just as Rudland was preparing to exit his vehicle, a nondescript car, which had been following him at a discreet distance, suddenly accelerated and pulled up behind him, blocking any chance of escape. In a matter of seconds, a hail of bullets struck his car, seriously wounding him in the neck and head. Rudland was rushed to hospital and survived the attempt on his life. Then in March 2020, just a few short months after the brazen attack on Simon Rudland, another hit sent shockwaves through South Africa's tobacco industry. The target this time was Mohamed Syed, a tobacco magnate and the chief executive officer of the Amalgamated Tobacco Manufacturing Cigarette Company. According to allegations that would later emerge, Syed had been marked for death by the same shadowy paymaster who had allegedly ordered the hit on Rudland. The plan was as audacious as it was ruthless. Gronewald and Showman had allegedly been tracking Syed's movements for weeks, studying his routines and habits with meticulous attention to detail. They had noted his regular trips to and from his office, the routes he took, and the times he traveled, seeking the perfect opportunity to strike. On one occasion, Sebastian Gronewald even followed Syed into a local mosque, planning to carry out the assassination while his target prayed. On this day, Gronewald dressed in traditional Islamic garb, with a skullcap and a long robe that allowed him to move unnoticed among the faithful, while also hiding hand grenades beneath the folds of his loose-fitting attire. Gronewald had allegedly managed to get within striking distance of Syed, close enough to observe his every move, but at the last moment the paymaster called off the hit because the mosque was too densely packed, and he presumably didn't want the extra attention of it being labeled a terrorist attack. He then instructed them to hatch a different plan and carry out the hit when Syed was alone. That opportunity, he believed, had finally arrived on that fateful day in March 2020. As Syed's car traveled down a busy highway, Gronewald and Showman pulled up beside him in a pickup truck, opening fire in a hail of bullets designed to leave no chance of survival. But in a horrific case of mistaken identity, the car they had targeted was not Syed's at all. Instead, it belonged to Shweb Dauji a close friend and associate of Syed's, who bore an uncanny resemblance to the tobacco magnate. Dauji was struck multiple times by the assassin's bullets and died on the scene. When police began to investigate the attempted murder of Simon Rudland and the tragic killing of Schweib Dauji, they initially treated them as isolated incidents. However, as they delved deeper into the evidence, a shocking connection emerged. Ballistics tests revealed that the same weapon had been used in both attacks. The R5 rifle that Sebastian Gronewald had wielded in his bloody campaign of revenge on the streets of Riger Park. However, by the time investigators connected these dots, it was already too late to bring Sebastian Gronewald to justice. On April 2, 2020, Sebastian Gronewald's double life came to a sudden and violent end. That morning, his body was found dumped in a field near Riger Park, still clad in his police uniform. He had been beaten and shot his police-issued firearm missing. Strangely, his cell phone was placed on his chest, hinting this was no random crime. His violent demise set in motion a series of events that would peel back the layers of his double life and expose the depth of corruption within the system. As investigators delved into Sebastian's death, a search of his police vehicle uncovered a crucial piece of evidence. The R5 rifle that had been stolen from the police armory and forensically tied to multiple murders. Ballistic testing soon confirmed the link. This was just the beginning of the unraveling. 
Information provided by Sebastian's close associate, Jonathan Showman, led police to raid a storage unit rented under Sebastian's name. Inside, they discovered a cache of illegal weapons, including pistols, a shotgun, ammunition, and most disturbingly, military-grade hand grenades, which police believed had been sourced through Sebastian's criminal contacts from Sandy F. stockpiles. Alongside the weapons was a stash of drugs. The find painted a stark picture of an officer who had strayed far from his sworn duty. Showman, who claimed to be Sebastian's getaway driver, initially provided investigators with a detailed confession, laying out their alleged crimes in the hopes of receiving a plea deal. He admitted to being the getaway driver in the string of Ryder Park revenge killings, as well as the attempted hits on tobacco industry figures, Simon Rudland and Mohammed Syed. The assassination attempts, he alleged, were aimed at giving their paymaster a competitive advantage by eliminating his chief rivals. However, in a dramatic twist, Showman later recanted his entire confession, claiming it had been made under duress. Despite this retraction, the evidence uncovered based on his initial statement was damning. Jonathan Showman was arrested and charged with an array of crimes, including murder, attempted murder, possession of illegal firearms and explosives. His arrest and indictment seemed like a major breakthrough in the case, a chance to finally get to the bottom of the web of corruption and violence. As Sebastian Gronewald's alleged right-hand man and getaway driver, he had intimate knowledge of their crimes and the wider conspiracy. Prosecutors were counting on him to be their star witness, the one who would blow the case wide open and bring down everyone involved, from the street-level hitmen to the shadowy paymasters. But then, in a shocking move that blindsided everyone, the National Prosecuting Authority announced in October 2021 that they were provisionally withdrawing all charges against Showman. No clear justification was given, no explanation offered for this sudden reversal. It was a decision that left the victims' families reeling, their hopes for justice seemingly snatched away at the last moment. The move sparked immediate outrage and raised a host of troubling questions. Was there some kind of behind-the-scenes maneuvering to silence Showman? Did his knowledge of corruption within the police and political establishments make him too dangerous a witness? Someone who could bring down powerful figures if he testified? Perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the Sebastian Gronewald saga is the figure who looms over it all. The shadowy paymaster alleged to have ordered the hits on Simon Rudland and Mohammed Syed. According to Jonathan Showman's initial confession, this mysterious individual was in constant contact with Gronewald, guiding the assassination attempts in an apparent bid to take out his rivals in the cutthroat tobacco industry. However, Showman maintains that he never knew the paymaster's true identity, as all communication was handled through Gronewald. Police investigations have reportedly circled around one prominent businessman as a key person of interest in the case, Yusuf Kaji, the head of amalgamated tobacco manufacturing. Kaiji's name surfaced in a secretly recorded conversation where the lead investigator in the case could be heard trying to pressure Showman's wife into implicating Kaji as the mastermind behind the hits. Showman's defense team contended this was evidence of the police attempting to frame their client. Kaji himself has vehemently denied any involvement, claiming the recording proves there is a plot to pin the crimes on him. To date, Kaji has never been formally charged in connection with the case. The allegations around a tobacco industry paymaster, ordering hits on his competitors, coupled with the police's apparent focus on Kaji, paint a disturbing picture of the shadowy underworld surrounding the cigarette trade in South Africa. The vast sums of money at stake have seemingly fueled a network of corruption, violence, and murder that reaches into the heart of law enforcement. And yet, with Gronewald dead, Showman's confession retracted, and the case against him provisionally withdrawn, the chances of ever getting to the bottom of this murky conspiracy appear slim. The mysterious paymaster, whoever he may be, remains at large, his identity still cloaked in shadow. Showman's claim that even he, as Gronewald's right-hand man, was kept in the dark only adds to the sense of a powerful, untouchable figure pulling the strings from behind the scenes. For now, this saga remains unresolved, an unsettling ellipsis. The full truth of why Sebastian Gronewald was murdered and by whom is yet to be told. The alleged paymaster behind a wider criminal conspiracy walks free, and the community of Riger Park is still waiting for justice for those cut down in a bitter feud. Sebastian Gronewald's story in many ways is a microcosm of South Africa's struggle with violent crime, corruption, 
and blurred lines between law enforcement and the underworld. It's a tale that exposes the cracks in the system and the way that criminality can seep into the very institutions meant to combat it. But it's also a profoundly human tragedy, a story of lives lost and families shattered, of communities living in fear and anger. For the people of Riger Park and beyond, the wounds inflicted by Gronewald's crimes and those of his brothers and associates will not easily heal. Until there is a reckoning, until the truth is dragged into the light, and those responsible are made to face the consequences of their actions, these wounds will continue to fester.